Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for uh, today's River Management Roundtable. My name is Angie Furman, and I'm the River Training Center Coordinator for River Management Society. And I'll be helping uh, moderate today's discussion. And today our topic is engaging Hispanics and Latinos on your river. And really excited about our panel today, just sharing um, some of their experiences. And I think we're gonna have some time at the end for Q&A and some discussion. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to that here in a second. But for those who might not be familiar, every month on the second Tuesday, we do these river management round tables. And these are ways for us to have virtual conversations and network, bring people together and share experiences uh, with each other. Our goal is to facilitate an open forum and an open discussion where we can work to support each other in our work and managing rivers and tackling common issues or uncommon issues by asking each other questions and sharing solutions and building camaraderie. So thank you for being here. These are open to anyone. So feel free to share these with your colleagues, friends, uh, and anyone who might be interested in this. Just a few notes for today. Uh, we are recording this, so you will be able to go back and find it. We will post it onto the River Management Society YouTube channel. And we are also gonna send it out to everyone who registered. So you'll get a copy uh, probably tomorrow afternoon, uh, link in your inbox, and you can find it there. We'd love uh, for you to be interactive. Again, today's supposed to be a discussion, so feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat as you think of them, and we can get to them. We can have conversations in the chat, but we'll also have time for you to come off mute. You can raise your hand, come off mute when called on, and ask questions or share experiences as well. Um, and then we also just ask, you know, to be mindful of allowing space for everyone to contribute to the conversation and speaking for yourself and um, just kind of staying on, on topic. So again, thank you for joining us. Now I'm really excited. I'd love to uh, have my have our panelists introduce themselves. We've got Marta de la Garza Newkirk. We've got Rolando Arieta, Ruby Gonzalez, and Gibran Lule Hurtado joining us today. And I'm going to have them go through one by one and uh, just introduce themselves <laughs> and why, why they're here. So, Marta, we'll go ahead with you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marta Delagarza Newkirk, and I'm a community planner with a program of the National Park Service called Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance and I am based in Austin, Texas. Thanks, Marta. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rolando Arrieta. Um, although it says National Public Radio, I am here as a whitewater kayaker, um, uh, first and foremost, and um, happy to share my experiences in, in that vein uh, uh, for, for, this, for this group. Uh, and I'm based in Washington, D.C. Thanks, Rolando. How about Ruby? Maybe we'll come back to Ruby because I'm not seeing, I see Ruby might be having connection issues. How about Gibran? Hey everyone, I'm Gibran Lule, and I actually work alongside Marta uh, in the Austin office for the Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program of the National Park Service. Thanks, Gibran. And Ruby, if you're there. She was with us earlier, so maybe we'll just come back to Ruby. Um, but Ruby is with the Forest Service. And uh, when she gets back, I'll let her further introduce herself. 
So today's uh, discussion, you know, first, we just want to recognize that we're talking about a very diverse group here or groups. Um, the Pew Research Center poll showed that 54% of Hispanic and Latino people in the U.S. don't really have a preference of which term is used, but there is a difference. And so just really highlighting that Latino is generally a term that's telling you about geography meaning uh, people from Latin America, which refers to mostly everything below the U.S. border, including the Caribbean. And then Hispanic is more of a term that's telling you about language um, or someone who comes from a country whose primary language is Spanish. So not everyone in Latin America is primary, primarily Spanish speaking, like Brazil. So um, just a little background and some context there. And then also, despite comprising about 20% of the population, Hispanic and Latino people are underrepresented in land and river management fields. So whether we look at federal agency data or even our own RMS membership composition or our own work teams, we can see this disparity. And uh, underrepresentation can cripple our ability to connect with other populations that we're serving, but it also means our teams are missing out on opportunities to learn and collaborate with people from diverse backgrounds and experiences. So with a little bit of this information in mind, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists to share a little bit more or a little bit of how they uh, came to their career paths, what that looked like, their connection with rivers, and so I'm going to invite them and you all to out there to highlight. Um, and then later on, we'll invite you all to highlight some of your work um, with Hispanic and Latino populations as river managers and within local communities and how we can uh, better connect with these communities. So I'm going to go back and we're going to start again with Marta and we'll kind of go through each of the panelists and have them each share a little bit about uh, their family background or where they grew up as part of their professional journey and falling in love with rivers. And then um, what made that experience as a Hispanic or Latino person easier or harder? Okay, thank you, Angie. Um, so I was born and raised in a town called Brownsville, Texas. It's the southernmost part of Texas. Um, in a region called the Lower Rio Grande Valley. It's right on the Rio Grande River and on the border with Mexico. Um, growing up, um, the river was a border. It wasn't really uh, a recreational resource for us, although we did have access points. Um, you might have to deal with the hassle of border patrol um, or some other authority checking on you to make sure that you were authorized to be on the U.S. side of the river. Um, so really my interactions with um, water were um, on the um, Oxbow Lakes that formed as the Rio Grande River sh has shifted its course over um, over time. And those are in, in Brownsville, they're called Rasacas. And I had the privilege of um, growing up on one. And so every almost every afternoon after school, my sister and I would jump into a John boat and canoe up and down the Rosacas of Brownsville, um, just observing nature. Um, sometimes, you know, throwing out a fishing line, but really just um, just being on the water or near the water. And that's how I fell in love with rivers. Although, again, my um, my experience and sort of my um, preference is for um you know, smaller, smaller water bodies, creeks, streams, um, wetlands, uh, marshes, bays, etc. That was my experience on the water. Um, and I had the incredible um, good fortune of um, learning about the Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program. We call it RTCA. When I was in graduate school, I um, was hired as an intern while in graduate school getting a degree in community and regional planning. Um, and I fell in love with RTCA and have been here ever since. Um, my experience with rivers as a Latina, again, is 
um, very um, significantly um, influenced by the fact that um, growing up to me and to generations before me, the river has been a barrier or even a dangerous place because in, re in recent years, um, the drug cartels and organized criminal activity have really made it practically impossible um, to get near the Rio Grande River. It's, it's just a difficult place now. Um, so that's me. Thanks, Marta. How about Gibran? I know you're you're also in Texas, so. Good yeah, thanks, Angie. Well, I'm in Texas, but my family's from central Mexico, and I'm from a pretty rural part of the country in southern Guanajuato state. Um, so just growing up, I feel like my family always associated the mountainous rivers of that area with danger. They're not really swimmable. Um, they could be fishable in the pools and in the dams. Um, but it was a lot of recreating by the river, but not in the river. So maybe you would wade, you would put your feet in. Um, we didn't really boat or fish at all um, or swim even. I didn't learn how to swim until I was in my teens, sort of jumping into that third question. That kind of made falling in love and accessing and enjoying rivers a little bit hard because I had that sort of fear where like most people in my family still don't know how to swim. So just approaching a river was very different for me um, before I knew how to swim versus after. Uh, as far as my professional journey, I used to be a grade school teacher. So when I finished college, I taught third and fourth grade in the Dallas area and just seeing children's reaction to nature lessons or going out by the creek or doing something like water monitoring or outdoor education versus doing something in the classroom that's more sit and get was just, you know, night and day. So I think that was the genesis of my love of the outdoors and nature and sort of um, educating people about nature as well. Uh, and then more personally, I really fell in love with the James River. I went to middle school in Richmond, Virginia, and we would go down there. And again, not really swim, but do a lot of wading and kind of um, observe the snakes and the animals and the plants in and around the river. So um, personally, that was probably the first river that I fell in love with. Um, yeah, and then I feel like I was saying before that um, in my family, the outdoors was sort of associated with work and agriculture. So when my family um, came to the U.S. and sort of took on more um, indoor professional occupations, there wasn't really that love or yearning to be outdoors or be by the river as much. Um, so those two things, I think not knowing how to swim until I was a teenager, and then not knowing how to boat until I was an adult, and growing up in a family that didn't really value outdoor time too much made it harder for me to connect with rivers. Thanks, Jibran, for sharing. How about uh, Rolanda? Yeah, thanks. So um, I'm from Panama uh, and uh, uh, first generation American uh, and, uh, you know, was kind of aware that Panama had some really great rivers, but very similarly to Gibran and, and Mata, it wasn't, yeah, it was sort of, you know, weekend trips with, you know, a bunch of people you know, in a crowded bus to just have a good time, wade in the water, maybe sort of, um, you know, do a little swimming, but not, certainly not sort of running any kind of rapids. Uh, you know, fast forward to my late 20s, early 30s, I fell in love with whitewater kayaking here in the district. Uh, we are about 20 minutes from driving distance um, to some of the you know, world-class whitewater kayaking. Uh, it's, you know, right in our backyard. And so I, you know, there's a big community, whitewater kayaking community here uh, in DC. And um, 
I really fell in love with the sport. And one of the things that was was great for me was to then go back to Panama and really appreciate those rivers in a way that I never had before or even cared about uh, before. So, um, you know, like I said, in my you know, late 20s, early 30s, I went to Panama and took a whitewater kayak with me and connected with some people from, you know, some Americans who were starting to discover Panama as a destination place for kayaking. Um, they had done a lot of rivers in Costa Rica and, and they had heard about these great pristine, you know, virgin rivers in Panama. So I did some first descents with them in my home country. So it was sort of this renaissance of being like, wow, like not only am I doing these great, beautiful rivers, I'm doing them in in my in my home country and sort of have discovered, you know, parts of the country that I had never cared about growing up there um, until I was you know, left you know, for, for college when I was whatever, 18, 19. Uh, so, so it was, it was wonderful to, to go back. I haven't returned to kayak in Panama for a very long time, uh, but I am planning on possibly um, going again uh, to just kind of check out those rivers over there. Um, and uh, so what uh, made my uh, experience as a, as a Latino, uh, easier or harder? Uh, gosh, I don't know. It's a process. I mean, I have, um, I have been. Uh, I was, I was fortunate to have been given an opportunity to write a personal essay about that specific question um, that is published on NPR. If you want to go check it out. Um, it's called what I'm really into. And, um, and I, it, I, I think, um, in there, I, I kind of express sort of what is, um, potentially not, not so much hard, but it's more sort of, um, an awareness that I've had throughout all of my, you know, kayaking career, particularly in the United States is, it's just an overall awareness of where kayaking, where I go and where kayaking takes me. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, only about three weeks ago, I was kayaking in Western, uh, in West Virginia, um, the Gauley River. Some of you are familiar with the Gauley River. And, um, you know, in, it's always been an awareness, especially if I'm traveling by myself. Uh, that I'm going through these back countries and I don't want to pick on West Virginia specifically, it's just anywhere. Um, and, you know, North Carolina, even here in DC and Virginia and Pennsylvania, where I normally go, um, it's just an overall awareness that I look differently than the people that I run into often. Um, I will make it very clear that nothing serious has happened to me. Um, it's more sort of just being aware um, that I am in most, if not all cases, the only person of color. And uh, and so, yeah, so I think it doesn't necessarily make it harder, but it does sort of bring a level of awareness that could, you know, make it a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's been wonderful to be able to to kayak in these places and you know on the east coast we have a lot of great rivers out here um in this area and so i yeah for the most part is what i, what I like doing thanks Orlando. ruby i'm not sure if you are there but if you are hello we like to yay awesome yeah. sorry yeah. i was having a little bit of connectivity issues, but I'm Ruby Gonzalez. I am a public affairs specialist for the Forest Service. I grew up in Long Beach, California, so more towards the beach. Um, I would say that I fell in love with rivers when I became the river manager um, on the Kern River in Sequoia National Forest. Uh, just the way that it kind of brought 
people together and seeing the different types of recreation um, really made me see the beauty in it instead of just like the natural beauty, just community that existed along the river um, is what made me fall in love with it. Um, I would also say in um, Yosemite National Park, the Merced River, just uh, tube floating down the Merced River and experiencing Yosemite in a different perspective also um, made me fall in love with rivers. I would say that my experience as a Latina person made it harder for me to get into river management or just public management in general. Um, just for the simple fact that a lot of the times I was the only brown person in a lot of these spaces. So um, I was I started off in the park service. So you're in these parks away from your family, away from your friends. And I was missing that community part uh, where I could relate to somebody else, where somebody can validate my experiences or maybe even the microaggressions that were um, that you get, you know, from from visitors and stuff. So just. Uh, I think that's part made it harder being away from uh, coming from a really diverse community to then moving to these outdoor spaces that are largely white um, and straight male was, um, I would say, hard. It made it harder, definitely. Thanks for sharing, Ruby. And um, like seeing lots of head nods. And, um, yeah, and thanks to all of you for sharing. I, our ne the next question, and really whoever's feeling like uh, compelled uh, can go ahead and start, but how might Hispanic or Latino perceptions of rivers differ for others? And so, um, like we know, one person might see a river as a place to like shred class four rapids or go for like a multi-day trip. And another might see it as a place to picnic, or maybe some people see it primarily as a food source. And so we just love to hear from the different panelists on how those perceptions might differ. Um, and then maybe like how we can help to overcome some of these barriers that present themselves. Yeah, Jibran, did you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I'll jump in on this one. Um, so I'll share a little bit before I answer the question directly about one project in San Felipe, uh, San Felipe Creek, which is in Del Rio, Texas. And it's actually this middle image at the bottom of the slide there. So San Felipe Springs and San Felipe Creek is this amazing, pristine, um, just aquifer and spring system that comes out of the Edwards Plateau and then creates San Felipe Creek, which runs for seven stream miles across Del Rio um, and into the Rio Grande. And it's just an incredible kind of oasis in this sort of, I would call it parched area of Texas um, uh, and just plays host to an amazing diversity of species, the Edwards Plateau and the Chihuahuan Desert and the Tamaulipan Shrublands all meet there. So there's just an amazing amount of biodiversity. There's an amazing amount of um, species of birds and um, insects that migrate through there. And we were called upon in 2018, 2019 to come down there and help develop a conservation and trail strategy for the creek system. And one of the first things we found as we were heading down there a, it was um, very different to engage with the Anglo population than with the um, Latino and Hispanic population, which makes up about 98% of Del Rio. Um, so when we did things like public meetings or, um, you know, Zoom meetings weren't a big thing back then, but when we tried online engagement even, it was mostly Anglo folks who showed up to every public meeting that were there. And in order to really get feedback um, from the Latinx population, we ended up having to meet them where they were. So going out to the plazas comerciales, to the malls, to you know the shops, there's a really great institution right there along the creek called Casa de la Cultura, which is a cultural and education center. Um, and then just 
doing in basically remote surveying where folks would go to the river and survey users as they came through. Um, so that was one thing that made our process different, just the engagement styles were very different. But then to answer the question more directly, what we found out through that engagement is that the Anglo community really valued the natural aspect of the creek. So things like how the ecosystem is doing and then um, how we can use the waterway. So tubing, kayaking, floating, all these things. Um, and then the Latino community also valued the ecosystem services, but not so much the outdoor recreation directly on the water. It was more things like camping on the stream banks, um, barbecuing and cultural events. So that to me was like a very night and day. It was very much like nature and outdoor rec on one side and on the other one more so cultural value and traditions. That's it. That's interesting to see. And I'm curious if any of the other panelists have any. Yeah, Marge, I see you shaking your head if you want to go. Yeah, ahead. so I'll add to um, Gibran's story the, um, the photos um, on either side of, of his or mine. And on that bottom right, you can see a Rosaka. That's um, the kind of water body that um, I grew up on. And um, I agree with Gibran. There's a lot of recreation stream side right, near the water. Um, and that recreation might be um, family gatherings or cultural events, you know, sometimes quiet contemplative spaces um, near the water, but not necessarily in the water. And there could be a myriad of reasons why. Um, but um, so I do, um, I would say that Hispanics and Latinos um, value um, water resources, but they value them maybe differently. Maybe it's something to um, to appreciate as um, someone on the outside of that um, of that water body or that um, water resource, not necessarily as someone who um, you know um, has has a desire to, um, to conquer, to conquer, you know, some big recreational goal. Um, so I would agree. Um, Hispanics and Latinos, um, value ecological services. They value water bodies, but still see them as something to approach, um, with, uh, a bit of caution or to leave or to leave space between um, their bodies and the water body. Of course, I'm not speaking for all Latinos, but um, I would agree that that has been part of my experience. I'm curious if others have similar experience. And again, you can feel free to like put stuff in the chat as well um, or raise your hand. And I'm curious if Rolando and Ruby have any thoughts on this from their perspectives? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, from you know from where I see things, I um, I have found you know that I think going back to you know like my mom, for instance, in Panama. Uh, she, uh, it, it's very difficult to relate to this idea of getting in a plastic boat and going down rapids um, and the dangers behind it. Um, I mean, we, I, I would say that, you know, most kayakers are aware how, how you know, it is uh, an inherently dangerous sport. Uh, but it requires discipline and it requires learning and understanding um, and just to uh, avoid, uh, you know, shortcuts that we might take uh, when it comes to being safe on the river. Um, uh, but I, you know, the few 
the people, Panamanians uh, primarily that I interacted with that got introduced into the sport really loved it. And it was, uh, you know, a small group of, of, of you know, young adults who um, are learning a, a new way at looking at rivers, very similar to my experience and, and have absolutely, you know, demonstrated that they loved it. They became raft guides, they became, you know, all kinds of things. Um, I think what, in that particular case, it was just a little bit challenging in that um, the level of support in, in, in cultivating and mentoring more uh, Latinos in, in Panama, but Panamanians primarily, um, just wasn't there. The infrastructure wasn't there. So uh, it's been kind of on a decline. Um, but I do think that there is... Um, you know, with 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 some mentoring and with uh, with with uh, a way to kind of introduce rivers, you know, for, you know, from in my experience, introduce rivers as a way of it being, um, you know, an athletic sport, an extreme sport, uh, could be very rewarding. It could, it could be really sort of uplifting and um, and. Uh, you know, it, it allows somebody to really challenge themselves and feel, you know, a sense of, of, of accomplishment and being connected to, you know, with nature. And, um, and, and so, yeah, to, to me, that I see this more sort of as opportunities to, to grow and introduce people to something that they may not either know much about or what little they know are thinking that it's not reachable because, you know, sort of what it what it looks like. It's too dangerous, or it's uh, um, not, um, you know, not the right thing to do for you know if you're going to a river. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Rolanda. Ruby, did you have anything that you wanted to add here? I think everyone pretty much explained the same things that I've experienced as a river manager, as a park ranger along these rivers, which is um, recreation looks a little bit differently, but that recreation, it's still recreation. Uh, whether it's, yeah, um, having a carne asada by the river or just enjoying, you know, there's a lot of intergenerational care that occurs in Latin communities. So that's when you get, you know, older folks like the grandparents and also the super young kids to come out and enjoy the river. Um, but I think that if we open those avenues and have them explore different things, um, I think I think that's another avenue to get them more involved in um, river advocacy or like somebody in the chat said, climate change. Yeah, and it also is like a kind of a nice segue to this next set of questions that I've got um, just around creating a welcoming environment and um, maybe thinking about why a Hispanic or Latino person might not want to participate in river recreation or conservation um, and then how how can we overcome these barriers or how can we like change some of these perceptions and better accommodate Hispanic and Latino river visitors and users and our coworkers and agency people and staff and all, all of the above. And I know you guys have mentioned some, you know, like there's like this like sense of safety um, or like this perception of like uh, maybe something like the cost of getting into something that could be a barrier um, or maybe even like signage, yeah. bilingual signage or. Yeah, I mean, I could start. I mean, I don't particularly, I would. I would say that it may not necessarily be that Latinos may not want to participate. Um, it could be that they perhaps are, and I'm going to talk specifically about the sport of whitewater kayaking, it just could be that they just um, don't know enough about it. They just, there aren't opportunities for um, for for, uh, for exposure to the sport. And that kind of has to go both ways. Um, you know, in my experience, I just happened to know someone who was a whitewater kayaker and for years, 
she suggested that I try it. And I was like, oh yeah, no danger. Like, no, no way, Jose. Um, sorry, I'm going to say Jose, but no way. Uh, and, uh, and I finally tried it and I loved it. And, um, and so there's, so there's that, right. But then once I realized that I enjoy this, you know, then the onus is on me to kind of continue to, to evolve and, you know, take it to the next level. Um, but I think, you know, primarily it's sort of like, it may not be that they don't want to participate. It's just that they just don't know about whitewater kayaking and, and I'm starting to work, you know, with, with Risa actually on some programs to bring the sport more to people of color within the Washington DC area. And we're making some progress. It's slow progress. It's not as much as I would like to have seen um, by now, but you know, it does take some time. And um, and I think so, yeah. So like we we overcome these barriers, I think. Um by by playing stewards of the sport that we love, right? And introducing it to people who may not have known about it otherwise. And and then and then following up um whereby, you know, is is you know coming up with the with the process or or a, a a structure where they can, you know, go back where they can you know, borrow equipment, you know, equipment, yeah, whitewater kayaking equipment is very expensive and it's very, you know, there's a lot of gear that you have to buy. Um, and just there, there are ways to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with any hope that some of these programs that we're developing is going to introduce the sport and bring more, bring more Latinos into it. Okay, then. Love it. Yeah, so I, I agree with Rolando and what I was I was thinking the same thing that um, programming is key. So and part of that may be just the fact that um, Hispanics and Latinos like to recreate in groups that, um, you know, sort of taking this on on your own um, might be uh, too big a, a barrier to cross. So um, having programming that um, that uh, brings people who don't have this experience in with people who do have the experience and allowing um, that setting to teach and to guide and to reassure um, and to, ex you know, explain um, safety measures and, you know, explain, um, you know, a little bit about what, what this experience might feel like. And I also agree with those um, equipment lending libraries, right? Um, I, and I think that's true for all people of color that, um, you know, a lot of this gear um, is expensive or it requires, you know, some technical know-how and um, people don't know where to start. And so having access to um, some, um, some lending libraries or, you know, even very low cost rentals I think would make a huge difference. But again, I, you know, I think one of the keys would be programming, you know, setting up these excursions, these events, these um, groups that um, make the introduction um, easier and give some friendly faces to the sport and give some, you know, sort of reassurance that, um, that this, this is something that um, folks are invited to and, um, that they would enjoy. And I saw Karita mentioned in the chat too, like, you know, in an urban environment, just having a place to store some of the equipment could be a barrier as well. Um, so great point there. I also saw, you know, Tali asked in the chat, just about um, Hispanic or Latino perceptions on the issue of advocacy related to climate change, specifically around rivers. And are there messages that resonate more with Hispanic or Latino communities regarding climate change engagement and advocacy, again, as it relates to water, rivers, and recreation? There's any thoughts there? I thought that was a great question. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's a DC-based organization, the Hispanic Access Foundation, that does periodic surveying around this issue. So they'll ask folks, what are the important environmental issues of today? Um, how can we get you to be more active about it? Why does it concern you? Or, you know, what specifically it concerns you about it? And I haven't read their most recent ones. I think they are biennial. Um, but the last one I read from 2020 said that messaging that really hit Hispanic communities back then was centered around family, legacy, and then faith and community was sort of like their the three big buckets of effective messaging. Uh, and it might have changed since then, but that's what I remember. They, they probably have a more recent report unless COVID got in the way, uh, and that's Hispanic Access Foundation. Thanks for sharing that that resource. And I can put a link to their website in the chat here. And then also, um, I think they're having like a film fest this week. So I could put some information into the chat as well about that. But it's free and open to people and um, looks pretty cool. It started today, so I can share more. Any other thoughts from our presenters on, you know, creating a welcoming environment or perception around like uh, uh, rivers and, you know, I guess kind of anything else that you'd like to share, like what you've done um, or some other ideas of what people can do to engage Hispanics and Latinos on the rivers or within their work teams? I can go real quick. Yeah. Um, something that I've done that is something really simple is just um, translating all of the park or forest material or any public land material. So it's bilingual um, and just also being like a friendly face when I go out and talk to people and having that friendly ranger attitude versus a more like authoritative or enforcement role, um, just coming in through an educative standpoint and then building kind of rapport and having them building trust with these communities. And I also would, um, when I would go out on hikes or when I would go out on like roves and stuff along the river, I would kind of note where families tended to recreate and the things that they were doing. So then I found my in, like in Yosemite, I would go in talking about bears. They're interested in that. They want to know more about it. And that led to a bigger conversation about proper etiquette, leave no trace, um, and you leave that like, you leave that conversation on a really positive note. Um, and I would also do like bilingual programming around like Latino artists or indigenous artists. And I would go out and invite the Latino people to this picnic area where I knew that a lot of them hung out and they had carne asadas there. So like just bringing the programming to um, these families is also super helpful and having it bilingual so then the parents and kids can both um, participate. That's awesome. Michigan Jen, that work really and some great advice. Any other thoughts that others would like to share? Oh, Risa. Hi. Um, so I'll share a couple of experiences and these are local, but I think they they translate. Um, Rolando mentioned that um, in our kayaking club, Canoe Cruisers Association, we have um, kind of experimenting with both a longstanding canoe and kayaking school, well-respected school, and a group in DC that's trying to get, that's working really hard at um, Soul Track DC, getting folks outside, all people of color. So and our relationship is, you know, started, but really awesome. And we had a class this summer where nine or so people took an intensive kayaking class for four Saturdays and two, Tuesday evenings, they had an option. So by the end of the month, there were a few people who were pretty good and pretty fired up about continuing. And we were, we started bending, trying to bend over backwards as a club to make, um, and during this week, like I was driving to Metro stops 
to go pick up people. And because they didn't have cars, they didn't have gear. So we were kind of bringing them to the river. So I did that eight times. So after the class is over, we shared the success with our group. And we had maybe 10 people in our club saying, I'll pick people up. I have gear. I'll leave a boat outside my backyard. They can come pick it up. And we asked people if they wanted to go to a, like a, like a meetup sort of um, trip that was exactly where they had gone the week before. And no one, no one showed up. So everybody was like really deflated. Like we have, we are a failure. <laughs> we have failed these nine people. But then we remembered that in any, any population of nine students, not everyone is going to continue. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to like, to force our welcomeness on people who may or may not it's not like they didn't care they weren't ready so it made us think we just have to approach this differently we have to approach it maybe just one by one we'll do it next year let's not get depressed if we don't have nine avid kayakers after one month so you know just it was meant we thought it was you know successful and we just have to try again and maybe do a little bit differently next time. We'll follow up with these folks two or three months from now instead of assuming they're so it's just, you know, it's just different. And um uh, and the other posts or I guess they conduct with an organization nearby like Riverkeeper an event called Rio Palooza each summer, spring, summer. And it's a corollary of another river in this group that had for many years. It was geared towards Latino folks. And the first couple of years, they tried social media. They sent emails out, not too successful. And they were using communication and outreach tools that worked for their, their mainstream audience, if you will. And then some bright person uh, thought about reaching out to Latino community through churches. So through communities where they they learn about events and whose events they attend as families. And they're crushing it now. <laughs> you know, so it they didn't realize because you know it was different how to approach folks. So now that those folks are attending in, in really great numbers, it's been a big success for a couple of years. Um you know, my personal experience with being an advocate for the environment did not come when I first started kayaking. I was worried about flipping over. I was worrying about learning a stroke. I was learning about how to be safe and meeting people who did this sport. So I think we, again, have to be patient and not assume that someone gets to a river and tries an open top kayak that they're, they're going to be gung ho for advocating for the environment right away. They're worried about staying up and want to make sure mom's okay and the, their little sister's okay and that they all have a good time. Then maybe after the next time or the next time or the next time, then you can say, hey, what do you think about this trash in the river? Or did you know the river's really low because we've had a drought? You know, that kind of discussion. So I think the process isn't that different, but I think in our earnest effort to engage lots of people en masse, in ways that work for uh, mainstream communities, we just have to adjust, you know, our strategies and tactics a little bit, and just be patient. And thanks, Teresa, for sharing. Any other um, thoughts, questions? Now's our time for just some open sharing, or like any other points that the panelists would like to bring up. Yeah, I think Risa made several good points. And one is that, and I think we, we keep trying to say that, that um, Latinos are created in family groups. And um, it's very important to introduce um, outdoor recreation activities um, to a multi-generational family group that the environment um, be set up that way um, in order for, in order to see um, very active participation by Latinos. Um, I also think just introducing people to, um, you know, recreating the outdoors. I've seen lots of programs um, uh, where family campouts are offered and all the, all the equipment, all the gear is set up, you know, families just pay a fee, they come and at those campouts, they learn, um, you know, 
about bird watching, fishing, hiking, etc. And so, um, again, I think um, the programming needs to be geared for our audience. And if our audience likes to recreate in um, multi generational groups, then that's the way we need to be setting up our programs. Great point. Any other questions or thoughts from anyone? And Joe, I'll share one other little story, but kind of on the same on the same theme as what Marta was just saying. Um, from one of our uh, former members who's now retired at the St. Croix, not St. Croix, at the Niobrara National Scenic River. Uh, he mentioned, and this is a couple of years ago, so it's kind of in history books now, but their camp, their picnic areas were not, their audience was almost exclusively, like overwhelmingly um, uh, people of color who were just floating tubes or you know, some kayaks, and they weren't utilizing the picnic areas, which seemed kind of weird. Um, so after a little while, they're just kind of scratching their head. And then as they were watching folks come in groups and families, they did the simplest thing. They moved, instead of having one picnic table here and another one 30 feet away and another one 30 feet away, they clumped the picnic tables. So you could have a picnic with 20 people. And very quickly, they became really popular. So super simple. They didn't buy anything. They just moved some picnic tables, but it was acknowledging or observing, realizing the nature of the groups that were attending. Yeah, that's really interesting how huh? just moving moving tables can change or just like make it so much more welcoming uh, to different groups. I was just going to circle back on the question about climate change um, and some of the efforts um, that are happening here in the U.S. Uh, I'd be curious to know uh, if anybody knows sort of how how much uh, focus there has been outside of the U.S. when it comes to river preservation. And I'll speak sort of again, going back to having kayaked in Panama. Um, you know, there is, I saw a lot of things that were frightening uh, by way of a, um, a river preservation um, and whatnot, and not only rivers, but creeks and communities that see these as, as dumping grounds, as, you know, um, you know, lots of, you know, chemicals, being, um, you know, flow into them. And, and these are rivers that I actually have been on, uh, some of them. And, um, and I just kind of, I think that there is a, there's a, um, it's great that there's an awareness uh, and there's some, some action from within the United States, but I'd be curious to know if anybody has done any studies or research on how there is an impact of rivers and climate change outside of the United States. And this is more of a question for me to the participants in, in this session. That's a great question, Rolando. I know of um, the Global Protection, or Global River Protection Coalition, the GRPC, and it's like a newly formed group that's New, newly ish that's um kind of like a coalition of organizations of people doing river protection work all throughout the world and there is a latin american regional subcommittee of that that has some different participation from people in like chile and um maybe costa rica i don't know if every latin american country is represented um but I'm curious to hear if people know of any other things going on. I'll just follow up on that Global River Protection Coalition. There are 
if you've heard of you know the rights of nature or the rights of rivers there are there are folks in a number of countries who have sought administrative change or some judicial or legislative change in their countries because of an industry kind of wrecking their lives because their lives uh, rely on rivers for recreation, tourism, sustenance, and for where the judgments or the laws passed, usually because of you know the work of a lot of people, have uh, either forbidden you know forbidden mining on a river or stopped a dam or in some cases given indigenous folks the ability to actually manage the river. So there are some examples that they're, they're, they're different by different country, uh, not the silent population who lets the government dump trash in the river without saying anything. Might have been, maybe used to be that way, but happening. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Risa. And I see um, Ruby shared in the chat also some videos that Hispanic, Hispanic Access Foundation created. Um, their advocacy videos or love letters for rivers across the nation. And they feature the Kern River and Ruby. So if anyone's interested, she included the YouTube link there. And then I also saw... Um, kind of jumping back to like gear lending and things like that. Lisa mentioned that she's found that partnering with their local libraries to provide kits that families can check out to explore their backyard public has been a, a success for engaging new members for them. So that's a really cool idea and curious to know what are in those kits. And then um, Karita mentioned that she was struck by the stories of not learning to swim or seeing rivers as safety concerns and was wondering about any partnerships that anyone has with pools or other places for water safety with uh, Latino or Hispanic communities. And that, and then Creed also mentioned that Outdoor Afro has the making waves, so that might be a place to start. But I'm curious if any of our panelists know of any other uh, partnerships or something like that. Well, maybe there's a there's opportunity for <laughs> for something there. I'm sure they're out there. I we just maybe that we haven't been. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our work hasn't called us to. Definitely, definitely. Well, we're kind of rounding out our time here, so I do want to just remind everyone that uh, we'll be emailing out a link to this, but you can um, find it on our YouTube channel, and if you subscribe, you'll stay up to date on any of our new roundtables. I uh, encourage you to share it with um, anyone who might find this conversation helpful or relevant, and um, just want to give a big thanks again to our panelists today, to Marta, Rolando, Ruby, and Gibran. Uh, really interesting hearing your perspectives and having you share your experiences. And I think uh, it's always important to just hear hear each other's experiences and and learn from that. So really thankful that you're willing to come and share with us today. And um, just a couple other quick reminders: some other upcoming events that we've got going on. We've got a river career discussion. Uh, series session going on tomorrow on policy and research pursuits. And then we also have a, or there's a ADASH collaborative webinar session taking place in November on men as active allied partners in the workplace. And that's the last session in the ADASH series for the year. And then lastly, would love to hear your thoughts on today's session. We use this when we're like planning and thinking about what we're going to do next year. Any feedback that we can get is super helpful. So I just put a link in the chat. We'll also send that out in the email tomorrow. But any any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, if there's anything else, any ideas, anything you want to share, any questions you have, feel free to reach out to us at RMS. You can reach out to myself, Angie, at riverdashmanagement.org. 
for either my colleagues, uh, Risa, Becca, and James. Sorry, James, I didn't put your email on there. <laughs> so thank you all again. And, um, yeah, have a great rest of your Tuesday, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all.